Hi and welcome to the show. Behind every great mind is a teacher who believed in them. My guest today has spent the past 30 years fostering the minds of many great people on this continent. She started off as a math teacher and is a passionate proponent of girls' access to education on the continent. She worked in the Ministry of Education in her home country of Zambia. She was the Zambian National Coordinator for Oxfam. And she is now the Executive Director for the Forum of African Women Educators. Hendrina Chalwe Doroba, welcome to the scoop. Hendrina, Thank it's you. a pleasure to have you here. Thank, Thank you, you very much for coming. Thank you for your time. Um, tell me a little, about, a little bit about growing up, Hendrina. Early days, first memories of Zambia. Mm -hmm. um, what do you remember? Well, first of all, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Um, great memories, very interesting one. I come from a very humble background. I come from a family of uh, 10. Wow, girls. so you have, you have nine siblings. <laughs> nine siblings. And unfortunately, at the time I was getting into school, my, mo my mother and father divorced. Mm -hmm. So I was one of those that um, experienced uh, that separation at the time of going to school. This is primary school primary or high school? school? Primary, primary school, primary school. Wow, um, so you were six, seven years old at this yes, time? Yes, I was actually six years yeah. old. And I was just about to start school. Uh, and so, and my mother couldn't leave me with my father, so I had to go with my mother to the village and so on. But she still enrolled me in a school where we had to walk. We, it was a weekly boarding. So we had to walk about 20 kilometers to get there and we stay in for five days and then we walk back and I remember my grandmother waiting by the roadside and just making sure. Were, were all, the, all your siblings together or did some of them stay with your dad? No, um, almost everybody stayed with my dad except okay. me and my elder sister. Okay. Uh, why, why was that? I think it's because we're the youngest in the, in the group okay. and so my, my mother didn't feel safe to leave them with them. So you were the baby of the group? I was the baby, not the smallest, the second smallest. The second baby. smallest, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay. And so she took us to her, her mother, mm. who was my grandmother, and then she left. Uh, so she left my elder sister and myself and went with the, the small baby. And I had to continue going to school. Yeah. And your dad, but your dad was a huge influence in your life. Uh, but that, that would have been later on. How mm. often did you see him when you were, once Very you moved? Very interesting. Um, you know, they divorced when I was getting into school and they reconciled when I was finishing school. Mm. So for me, that is the greatest achievement in my life. I it's, didn't it's enjoy... watching them both get back together. Get again. back together and just um, calling mom and dad in the same house was very interesting. Mm. But it was short-lived, unfortunately. Uh, tell me a little bit about what did your dad do? What was his profession? My father was a teacher. So he was a teacher in yes. the same school that you No, went in to? a different school. Mm. Um, where they divorced is a, about three hours drive to where we were, st where we were staying, my mother's village. And so he was in a different school and then he moved. He was a, t a head teacher of a school mm -hmm. and then he was promoted. By the time of his death, he was the boarding master of a teacher training college. What did you want to be when you were a child? <laughs> you had dreams and ambitions, obviously. Yeah. What did you, what was your first, you know, all of us want to be pilots or, or astronauts or no. uh, scientists. What did you want to I, be? I think for me, I, want, I wanted to be a soldier. Really? A soldier. And but, but why? I'm not sure why, but uh, I think I'm, I was coming from a background where uh, I had known very little about what soldiers do and all that. And then when I got into primary school, we used to have all these essays writing about the Zambian army and what role they play and how they protect the country. And I remember at that time there was uh, instability in our neighboring country. And my father always used to talk about it, to say, you know, you have to be sovereign to your country, you have to do this, you need to protect your country. Was he ever in the army? No. He, he never fought or anything? No, he never fought. But he was very passionate about mm. peace and um, he, he didn't like fighting. And so he was, he's a, he was a peacemaker. And when did that change? When did reality set in? I um, think that, that grew up very strong, by the way, to the point that uh, I started negotiating with my father and my father kept saying, well, you do what you like. If you want to be in the army, go ahead. And so even when I was at, uh, at school, I joined uh, there's a cadet force, more like a petty army within the school. Right. I did that. And, and were there other girls that were with you? 
a few other girls yeah. were there, a few other girls, yeah. and then I, I got promoted and got all the different kinds of ranks. I was actually commissioned as a cadet officer. Really? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow. And so I was getting ready to join the army. But unfortunately, um, I told you my father reconciled with my mother when I was just finishing, mm -hmm. and unfortunately that same year towards the end he passed on, and I was just about to write the exams. From that moment, Everything just changed. What, was he ill? Um, he had a stroke. He had a stroke. And but no uh, symptoms before that? Didn't nothing, know that he was... nothing. And I remember that day I was coming from school. Then I just found him lying and I thought he was in pain or something, but he was already gone. So when I called so my mother... you found him? Yeah, I found him. And I called my mother. I said, I don't know what's happening to daddy, but something is wrong. My mother said, oh, he just passed. We've just been talking to him just a few minutes ago. Mm. And, I was, and then I said, no, but there's something wrong. And they were like, no, it can't be. He's just passed three years, gone back to the office. So nobody believed until I had to drag my mother. I said, something is wrong. So my mother came and said, oh, no. Then we called up people. When I was talking to my sisters and telling them, oh, my father has died, they were like, no. I talked to him last night. He didn't complain of anything and so on. So it was, it was very shocking. And, and what does that do to a now 16, 17 year old girl who was very close to her dad yes. and has to sit exams? I was, I was very disappointed and I think everybody, I didn't like the way people now started looking at me because I was daddy's tomboy and so everybody was wondering and looking at me from different sides and so on. So I had to just get up the courage and I said, okay, I need to handle this and uh, I need to write the exams because that was a week before my exam. So uh, it, was, it was tough. So, so let's go from passing your exams, which you did, mm -hmm. obviously, mm -hmm. to getting the scholarship to go to Australia. Mm -hmm. um, how difficult was it? Had you ever traveled outside of Zambia before this? No, uh, very interesting. So what happened is when I finished my... my um, secondary school we had to go for compulsory national service at the time so i went for military training of course i enjoyed that so you got your offer you got yeah, your, your soldier I got the opportunity. Bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so i went for that and they came back and then i was accepted to go to teacher training college as my first choice and i accepted and everybody was like but with your results where do you want to go to teacher training and so on but one of the challenges i had was that um, when my father died my mother was going through a lot of difficulties because of that transition process and I didn't have um, enough support to go to, to university. So I opted, the whole idea was for me to get a job, get trained and go out and start teaching. So I went for teacher, teacher training college. I did three years, I finished and then I graduated. And I graduated very young, by the way. Well, how old were you when you graduated? I was about getting to 20. I had just graduated my, um, celebrated my 19th birthday. We'll be right back with Andrina Doroba. Stay with me. Hi, welcome back. I'm here with Hendrina Doroba. Hendrina, before the break, we were talking about, you know, finishing your teacher's training college, but mm -hmm. at a very young age. Yeah. Um, had you ever traveled overseas? No. Had you ever left Zambia? No, no, I had not. And so I what made you apply for a scholarship? What happened was that, uh, um, I want to tell you a little bit about mm -hmm. my journey to the school where I was, um, where I started teaching. When I graduated, I was posted to a boys' school to go and teach at a boys' school. And uh, when I arrived there, the, the headmaster just said, looked at me and said, you're not coming to teach my girls, my boys. And I'm like, oh yes, I'm a qualified teacher. Yeah. And he said, no, 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 I'm taking you back to the ministry. They need to find you another school. I have big boys here and I'm not going to tolerate that. And I thought he was joking. So I went back to the ministry and I said, this is what has happened. And the minister said, oh, I just had a head teacher from uh, another school. They are looking for a maths teacher. Would you be interested to teach girls? I said, of course. And that's how I got on to go to a girls' school. So when I got to the school, you know, I was young. Yeah. The people I was teaching were almost my age. And uh, interestingly, I met one of them just two, two weeks ago. It was one of uh, my first students. I went in and they were like, we cannot be taught by, by a fellow girl like ours <laughs> and mathematics. <laughs> and they started walking out. Yeah. And I'm like, ah, you guys, why are you walking out? Said, no, we can't. I mean, this is a very serious subject. We can't be taught by, by a girl. But a few remained. 
So I started engaging and chatting and I was actually teaching mathematics from a very practical perspective. Did the others come back? They did. Yeah. By the end of the term, everybody came back. And like I told you, I met one who is at the African Union just two weeks ago uh, at the summit. And she looked at me and said, I can never forget you. Yeah. So it's my teacher and uh, everybody looked that at me. That must be very heartwarming. Yeah, it must it be was, quite amazing for you to see I was so excited. Where, where these, these, these young girls that you helped shape and, and not doing anything else but doing, she's an accountant. So it's still in the still field. Still in the field of mathematics. <laughs> so I was, I was very excited. And yeah. so getting the scholarship, how did you apply for the scholarship to go so to So for the Australia? scholarship, I went to that, it was a rural school. And then we got um, um, a notice from the newspaper saying, oh, they are looking for teachers of mathematics. Female teachers are encouraged to apply. And I remember I was in the staff room and I was telling my colleagues, oh, this is my, this is my scholarship, so I'm going to apply. Yeah. And everybody was like, you're a joker. Yeah. So I sat in, applied, and I was called for interview. I went in for the first interview, second interview, before you knew it, I was, I was selected. And how was it? What was the first experience? What was your first impression of landing in, was it Melbourne or Sydney or Perth? Melbourne. In Melbourne. It was, it's Perth, we just passed, uh, so, uh, Brisbane, so we just passed. So you get off in Melbourne, what did you think? Australia is very much like Africa. Yeah. In terms I, I, of climate was, and things like that. I think there was more excitement than anything. I got off in Melbourne and we were given this tour and we were going by the, the, the river and so on. And we were given, it was a very prestigious scholarship, by the way. It was by the mines um, and it fully furnished. The first few weeks we were given this posh, nice apartment. I'm like, it can't be me. So it was very exciting and. Uh, I toured Australia like anything. <laughs> really? You went everywhere? <laughs> I went Took everywhere. I went to caravans. Yeah. I did all kinds of things. And the good bit is uh, I was also doing very well in, in, in school. Mm. I was doing very well in school. So How long was that experience then? Three years. That was the full course? Yes, yeah, three years full course. Before I had gone, before I left, I had started doing my, um, my degree program. Right. And because I had done my diploma program, so they, they, they accredited that. And what that meant, actually, I could have completed the degree program in, in two years. And then they gave me one year where I did my postgrad mm -hmm. in mathematics because the scholarship was for, for three years. But the plan was always to come back to Zambia. Oh, that yeah. was always the plan, to come back home, to come back. experience all these places, and but come back home. And I couldn't believe, when I told my colleagues that I'm going back, they just said, no. Because you could have got a job easily. In oh, Australia. yeah. Oh, yeah. They yeah. wanted actually to offer me a um, master's program for scholarship. And I said, no, I'm going back. What's so special? I said, no, I have to go back. And they couldn't, they couldn't understand that. So coming back home, yeah. what do you do then? You, you can't go back to that same college. You mm -hmm. have obviously got these wonderful qualifications. Mm -hmm. You've got a master's. Yeah. What are the job opportunities here? After that, in fact, a few months later, I was offered to be the inspector of schools for mathematics. And I turned for it down. For the whole country? For the, for the region. For the region. The southern right. region. Right. And I said, no. And they you couldn't. wanted to teach? Yeah, I wanted to teach. Yeah. I, said, I said, no, that, that I'm not going to inspect. I, I, I want to change what is happening in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And so the inspector couldn't believe and couldn't just understand why. But I told him, I just don't want to teach. I want to be part of the team. So that when the opportunity for teaching teachers on how to teach mathematics came in as an in-service program, I said, that's where I want to go. So I got that. I went for interviews and I got it. And I did a lot of work around in-service provision, helping teachers on how to teach mathematics from a, a gender perspective and making it easier, simple, and um, supportive of the students for quite some time. You always seem to know exactly what you wanted to do and mm -hmm. the path you wanted to follow. You were quite sure of where you wanted to be, where you didn't want to be. Mm -hmm. If young people were to come to you for advice mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. Um, and say, Henria, tell me, what should I study? What is the advice you would give them? I think, first of all, you need to uh, uh, recognize where, what are some of the things that you are passionate about mm. and what are the principles behind that. And when I say being passionate, it doesn't mean because I've seen my friend X is doing that and I want to go that direction. Mm. There are certain things that you want to do because you feel you want to do them. And that's what happened to me. And if a a girl or anybody came to me asking for advice, I would want to know and appreciate what is their passion. What are some of the things that they like doing, which they appreciate. 
and I like the I like the the focus of the African Union in as far as mm. promoting agriculture and also promoting youth engagement in agriculture. I think for me that's the way to go. We need we need to make the agriculture sector very at attractive. And for the women, I don't want to see the women just in the in the field. In the field. I yeah. want to see entrepreneurs coming out, processing, adding value to, to the products that are coming out. And that's my desire. We'll be right back with Hendrina Dorova. Stay with me. We have the scoop on Uber. And it's a first free ride of up to 500 Kenya shillings if you use the promotional code the scoop. To climb aboard, simply download the free Uber application for your iPhone, Android, or Windows phone. Uber and the Scoop, keeping Africa moving. Hi, welcome back. I'm here with Hendrina Doroba. Hendrina, the move from, I mean, you're passionate about education. That's, that's mm -hmm. been obvious throughout this whole discussion. Mm -hmm. But what attracted you to going to the NGO field? Yeah. Where did you feel that you could, where was that interest coming from? Where did you feel you could make a difference in that way? Yeah, um, it all started, you know, I was working with ministers of, Minister of Education and then I realized that um, there were certain things that were not moving, which needed a little push uh, from, from outside, which mm -hmm. I couldn't change in the inside. And when the opportunity to coordinate a capacity building of civil society that are working and supporting um, uh, the ministries of education, I, I thought that was an opportunity. I said, wow, so this is something that I could do. Before then, I was working with ministry. We were trying to um, uh, support the decentralization process and improving the quality of learning and so on. And there was a lot of push, push and back and push and back. And, I, I felt a little bit frustrated. At that time, I was working for Irish Aid, mm -hmm. as, as uh, working within the setup of a donor and all that. You could only do so much. So when the opportunity to support civil society came in, I said, this could be an opportunity for me to, you know, to move on. And at that time, um, I had just lost my husband. There was also an issue of... Mm settling in. He was a very jovial, outgoing kind of a person. I couldn't fit in his shoes. So when I remained alone in that city, I really wanted to get out because everywhere I moved, it's like everybody's, oh, where is he? And what's happening? Well, what happened again? Because what happened? He's, again, he died um, a sudden death. Hmm. He, he, How old was he? He was about 40... 48. So very young man. Mm, he was very young. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And, and what, what happened? Again, strokes? No, he had meningitis. He had meningitis and by the time they conf confirmed that it was meningitis, it was too late. And unfortunately, when he got that attack, I was not home. I was, I was in Dublin for, for some meeting. Mm -hmm. On my way back, that's when I was thought, oh, he's in intensive care and so on. By the time I got there, he actually improved for a day, I guess for my sake. Mm. And then after that... When they were about to do their puncture thing. Yeah. He did. And how does one catch meningitis? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's easy to catch it? or we, we didn't understand it very well, but I think he had some malaria which was not properly mm -hmm. managed because mm -hmm. he was doing a lot of field work where he was working. And it is an, a malaria prone area. And I think they used to treat him for malaria without knowing that it had actually affected the spine. And is this when you left the country? So no, that's when I left uh, Irish Aid yeah. and I went to Oxfam. That's when the opportunity now for supporting civil society right. came in. And so I joined and uh, I enjoyed what I was doing. Yeah. And this then? This was, then then saw me to come to, to, to Fawe. Fawe. And now this is again where your heart is. Interesting, yeah. When I, when I was working for the Oxfam, um, I remember one of my colleagues again, People see something in the paper and they tell you, Henrina, something that looks like your yes. job. Please look at it. I'm like, and then I said, okay, I'll look at it. Second day, but you know, closing date is, I said, okay. So I looked at it and it was good. So I said, okay, I'm going to apply. And I got it. When I told my boss I'm moving, he couldn't believe it. You must have made quite an impression at Oxford. <laughs> yeah, he just said, no, Henry, no, you can't go. Uh, this. And, and that was the move to Kenya. I mean, the, the, the head the office is, Kenya. is in Kenya yeah, for Fawai. That was the, and I was not working for Fawai at the time. Yeah. But because it was issues to do with girls and it was to do with capacity building of teachers, I said, yeah, that's where I want to go. Uh, yeah. This segues into leadership. It's a question mm -hmm. of a lot of these things need leadership. Yeah. Um, we 
seem to not have the right political leadership mm -hmm. on this continent. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on that? Where do you see the next generation of leaders coming from? When you look around, you interact now with heads of government, heads of state, mm -hmm. you go to, to AU summits, you, you are, you're in the, 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 the circle of the doers and the shakers. Mm -hmm. um, where do you see the problem of leadership and how do we address it where you have 70, 60, 70, 80 year old men, not so many women, mm -hmm vying for presidential power mm -hmm. um, when maybe there's an entire, there's 70% of our population mm -hmm. that is young, young and has no connection to these people that works on new technology that mm -hmm. understands um, and gets information in a different way. How do you see how do you see us navigating this? Um, I'm hopeful that we can strengthen our succession, succession plans because I think that's where the problem is. The, the old are holding on to the jobs and the young are too anxious to get and so they don't have the patience and you, you know, they don't build the skills required to be able to, to take up those positions. And then there's a disconnect between the upcoming leaders and those that are already in position. So if only we can strengthen the mentorship and um, succession plan, I think that, that would help. Shadowing and supporting pulling up the young ones coming. But the young ones also should not be in a hurry because sometimes they, they are too excited. They don't take time to understand and appreciate where they are and what, what they can do and what they cannot do. But also the elderly also are in a position that they know it all and so they need to move on without recognizing that the environment in which they are working has changed that may require you know, new skills, technology is taking up and so on. So bridging that gap and making sure that this mentorship actually is um, put into action. Going back to women in power, mm -hmm. um, we, don't have, we have not even a handful of women presidents yeah. uh, on this continent, why? Because the environment doesn't allow, doesn't seem to create that uh, enabling policies and also support for the women to take up those positions talk about leadership at that high level, but also leadership at school level. I mean, the kind of environment that we go through, that I went through as a student, if I didn't persevere, I don't think I could have finished. So it's about creating an enabling environment that actually recognizes and appreciates both sexes as human beings and who have the potential and the capacity. And this is where my father used to tell me to say, you know what, if you open that brain of yours and you look at the brain of your, your brother, mm. there's no difference. So you can do and Brothers everybody else. Brothers might be smaller. Yeah, <laughs> you can do it and everybody else can do it. So unless we get that sense even from our leadership to look at me as a woman, as a person who has the potential to be able to make a contribution, we will not reach there. Mm. Secondly, when you look at the platform where this is happening, are we creating enabling environment? The fact that I want to go in a position of leadership does not stop me from being a woman. I'll still be a woman. And, and I'm not saying I want to be a man. Mm. I'm simply saying give me an opportunity so that I can show my potential, so that I can show my ability. But you are not going to draw away my womanhood. I'm a woman and I'm proud to be a woman. And you know, you're still a young lady. Mm -hmm. um, You've had an amazing journey, but what's the future? What's next for you with Fawe, after Fawe? I'm seeing myself going back and supporting the women out there. I'm still into my agriculture mm -hmm. passion and more of engaging and supporting women to add value to the, the produce that they bring out. To and continue. education will, obviously, will yeah. obviously always be close and to The your way heart. I'm planning to do that is... Um, putting up a technological center where these women from the village, and I'm not talking of graduates, I'm talking of those that have minimum qualification are coming in to do some work that will help them either improve their livelihood in one or the other from the agriculture perspective. And I'm talking improving on the way they dry their mm -hmm. organic foods, and the way they process, they package, and all that kind of thing. My desire is I want the women to move away from being laborers in the farm to be an entrepreneurs. Andrea, the show's called The Scoop. I asked my guests to tell me something about them that hopefully nobody in the world knows. So if your son, sons and daughter 
are watching this and they mm. look at it and say, I didn't know that about Mama. What would your scoop be? <laughs> <laughs> that nobody else knows. Yeah. Um, quite, quite a bit, actually. Um, I sleep less hours and pretend like I've slept for a long time. <laughs> That's one, one thing. Um, I don't know how to explain this. I, I think there's, 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 much as people think I, I, I support others, but the degree to which I do that, very few know, if at all. So I think being selflessness, if I may use that word, yeah. And that's the sleepless, selfless <laughs> scoop with Hendrina <laughs> Doroba. Join me again next week when I'll be talking to yet another great African personality. From me and the entire team of The Scoop from Nairobi, Kenya, thanks for watching. Hendrina, thank, thank you so much. Asante sana. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank you for everything. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Thank mm -hmm. you for your wonderful story. Thank what you. an amazing life you've had. Thank you. I appreciate it.